Hello friends and welcome or welcome back to the page. Today we are going to be doing a romance deep Bible study. As you can kind of see, we have Bibles everywhere. So you guys have probably seen if you watch my vlogs, me mentioning this Romans devotional that we're doing through my church. So I figured for this Faith Friday that I would actually show you guys what we do every morning and kind of just do a random day of the devotional with you guys. So we are going to be studying Romans 4, 1 through 12 today. So make sure to grab your Bible because we are going to be reading, we're going to be taking notes, and I'm going to be talking you guys through all the things that I do and how our typical morning looks. But with all that being said, if you're interested in faith-based content, daily life of a 25-year-old living in South Jersey, make sure to go ahead and smash that like button and subscribe to my page and make sure post notifications are on because I do post at least three videos a week, one on Wednesday, one on Thursdays, and one today on Faith Friday. So, for starters, I'm always taking notes on my iPad. I talked about this in my last Bible study, so I'm not going to bore you with more iPad plugs. But with that being said, I'm just going to talk through what I do. So, we're doing Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. So we start with the devotional and then we'll do enduring word on my husband's cell phone. So we do no cell phones before seven, I think it is after holy hour, but we do use our phone. We use our iPad and things like that for Bible resources, but no checking notifications, no texting people, no emails, things like that before 7 a.m. But with all that being said, let's get started. Romans 4, 1 through 12, righteous in his eyes. What then shall we say Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by his work, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What the scriptures say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him righteous. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteous. David says the same thing uh, when he speaks of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord never counted against them. If this blessedness is only for the circumcised or also the uncircumcised, we have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? What? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of righteousness that the body had had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he also he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also followed in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had when he was circumcised. Our father Abraham was an important phrase that Jews of Paul's day jealously guarded. A circumcised Gentile co covert to Judaism was not allowed to refer to Abraham as our father as this was only something a natural-born Jew was allowed to say. A Gentile convert had to call Abraham your father. Paul throws out the distinction and declares that through faith in Christ, all can now stand united and say, Our Father Abraham. It must have been a shock and possibly an outrage for Jewish readers of this, of this letter to see Paul, a Jew himself, calling Abraham the father also of the un uncircumcised people. Paul declares rightly that the faith is in Christ is not circumcision or works. It is the vital link to Abraham and being grafted in as part of Israel. It's far more important to have Abraham's faith than it is to have Abraham's circumcision. Meaning Abraham's inner faith, which led to the obedience to God, was far more important than his outward works, acts of obedience, or ethic genealogy. That remains true to today. It was far more important to know what is on the inside of a person and how faith leads to good works rather than first focusing on the works themselves produce. The early church in Rome had many of the same questions and concerns. People have today related to the idea of faith and works in the old version of the newcomer. Some wonder what is the point and purpose of God's actions before Christ Jesus had changed everything. We might ask something similar today. Why study the Old Testament? Are the Old Testament laws and principles still relevant? What is the point of the Mosaic law? How does salvation work for the people who lived before Christ was born? Building on thoughts of, from the previous chapter, Paul begins and answering these questions using Abraham as an example to make his point. Abraham was the most esteemed man among the Jewish people in his day, and even greater than George Washington of the American. Many Jewish teachers at the time were using Abraham as a reason why they should live according to the law, and that their salvation and deliverance would come 
through their own ability to keep the law. They believed Abraham was justified by his works, and by keeping the law even though the law itself would not be given, the Mount Sinai for many hundreds of years after Abraham lived. Ancient passages from the rabbi say, We find that Abraham our father had performed the whole law, and it was given, and that Abraham was perfect in all his deeds with the Lord. Paul did not agree with this, and argued against this flawed approach, using the, the same example as Abraham used to make his own case. Paul taught that righteousness, justification, and ultimately salvation did not come from Abraham, except that he believed in God and had faith in God, which led to obedience and looked to God for his salvation, not to his own works. Old Testament scripture agrees with Paul's stance. Genesis 15, 6 tells us that Abraham believed God and was accounted for him for righteousness. Abraham's righteousness did not come from performing good works, but only from belief and faith in God. In fact, Abraham was counted as righteous in Genesis 15, 6, yet he did not receive the covenant of circumcision until Genesis 17 which was at least 14 years later. This proves that Abraham's righteousness wasn't based on circumcision or keeping the law, a sign of the covenant. It was also based on faith in God alone. Also note that the Apostle Paul does not say that Abraham was made righteous in all his doings, but God accounted or credited Abraham as righteous. Our own justification or salvation is not God making us perfectly righteous. Press on. But his counting counting us as righteous because of the work of Christ. The word used is in the passage, which translated to count it or credit it, is the Greek word log logizima. Logizamai. Yeah, logizamai. It was an accounting or bookkeeping term that meant to put down to one's account to let revenues be placed on deposit at storehouse. Essentially, it was the idea of putting credit down on a person's account. Thus God put Abraham's account place a deposit for him and credit to him righteousness. Remember that righteousness is also more than just an absence of evil and guilt. It is the positive it is positively added good, meaning that God does not only declare us innocent but righteous in his eyes because Christ is in us. Paul also explains and makes a more important distinction between grace and works. The idea of grace stands opposite to the principle of works. Grace has to do with receiving the freely gift of God, while work ha works has this, have to do with earning our merit before God. Works place God in debt to us, whereas grace puts us in debt to God. And these two distinctions are worlds apart. Even today, we are not saved or counted righteous because of any good deeds by keeping a certain standard of holiness and purity, but because of our faith in Christ and the grace that comes as a result of that. Holiness, purity, and righteous living should flow from our lives as a result of God's forgiveness, not a not as a cause of it. Though Paul's teaching, we can better understand that we are not two ways. There are not two ways to salvation: saved by works through law keeping in the Old Testament, and by grace saved through faith in the New Testament. Everyone who has ever been saved, Old or New Testament, is saved by grace through faith. Ultimately, all salvation comes through Jesus and nothing else. In this way, Jesus was correct when he declared that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. Dun, dun, dun. So for some context, I wrote, Gentile converts were not allowed to say, Our Father Abraham. I also wrote that the Jews believed that Abraham was justified by his works and that he was made perfect in or by his deeds, rather. And then I wrote that Paul says, contrast to that, that justification, righteousness, salvation, or rather righteousness, justification, salvation, come by his faith or came by the faith of Abraham and not his deeds. And I actually wrote down where it says in Genesis 15, that's when Abraham was counted as righteous. And it wasn't until 14 years later in Genesis 17 that he was actually sealed with the covenant of circumcision. So I wrote those things down and then I also wrote down the definition of the Greek word credited. So now we are going to do enduring word. So starting with one, do you want me to read? Yeah. <clears throat> one through three, Abraham was not justified by works, but declared righteous through faith. What shall we say? In building on the thought begun in Romans 3.31, Paul asked the question, does the idea of justification through faith apart from the works of the law make what God did in the Old Testament irrelevant? In answering that question, Paul looks at Abraham, who was the most esteemed man among the Jewish people of the day, even greater than George Washington of the American people. So you will notice a lot of the things that we read, or not a lot, but some of the things that we'll read in Enduring Word are also in our True North devotional. But if you guys are interested in getting Enduring Word, it's a commentary app, which clearly my church used to create the devotional that we have. It's definitely a great resource if you're studying on your own and your church did not make a devotional for the book that you're studying. So I'll have the link for this app down below in the description.
<clears throat> if anyone could be justified by works, they would have something to boast about. Nevertheless, such boasting is nothing before God, but not before God. This boasting is nothing before God because even if works could justify a man, he would in some ways still fall short of the glory of God, which we went over yesterday in Romans 3.23, which just says all have fallen short of the glory of God, none are righteous, not even one. Mm -hmm. Amen. Is that your favorite verse? Mm -hmm. That's funny. I remember you told me that. Do you remember my favorite verse? Uh, no. Proverbs. No, it's not. Uh, <gasps> Do you remember my favorite verse? <laughs> Heartbroken. Anyway. Uh, what's it? <clears throat> Galatians 5.22. Because it's my birthday verse. You just say 5.22. Do you know what Galatians 5.22 is? Okay. I know, it's so bad. But the fruit of the spirit is this: love, joy, <laughs> peace, patience, uh -huh. kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, or kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, mm -hmm. self-control. Mm -hmm. Against such things there is no law. It's twenty-two to twenty-three, but we'll count it as one. one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, such a point. If justified by works, God owes us. But if we're justified by grace, we owe God. Where did you read that? That was in the devotional, but it's, this was talking about here. For oh, time. gotcha. <laughs> but this boasting is nothing because before God, every pretense is stripped away. And it is evident that no one can really be justified by work. The Old Testament does not say that Abraham was declared righteous because of his works. Instead, Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Paul makes it clear, Abraham's righteousness did not come from performing good works, but from the belief in God. It was a righteousness obtained through faith. Generally, the Jewish teachers of Paul's day believed that Abraham was justified by his works, by keeping the law. Ancient passages from the rabbis say, we find that Abraham, our father, had performed the whole law before it was given, and Abraham was perfect in all his deeds with the Lord. The rabbis argued that Abraham kept the law perfectly before it was given, keeping it by intuition or anticipation. So it's kind of like we were talking about a few days ago with like how can people be saved if they don't have the law or if they don't have a bible mm -hmm. but this is kind of saying like even then the rabbis were saying like god wrote the law on the heart of abraham and the verse said like god writes the law on, everybody. on everybody's heart yeah. that's mm -hmm. were you thinking that no, I mean, not specifically that, but, like, I mean, kind of along the same lines of what I was thinking, which is, like, one of God is righteous, and, like, I like guess not what we were thinking, mm -hmm. but, like, what we discussed, like, you know, obviously, it's up to everybody conscious, and at the end of the day, God is righteous judge. Yeah. The Apostle Paul does not say that Abraham was made righteous in all of his doing, but God accounted Abraham as righteous. Our justification is not God making us perfectly righteous, but counting us as perfectly righteous. After we are counted righteous, then God begins making us truly righteous, accumulating at our resurrection. Counted is lagizomal, <laughs> lagizomai, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. It was used in early secular documents, Put down to one account, let my revenues be placed on deposit at the storehouse. I now give orders generally with regard to all payments actually made or credited to the government. Thus, God put to Abraham's account, placed on deposit for him, credited to him, righteousness. Abraham possessed righteousness in the same manner as a person would possess a sum of money placed in his account in a bank. I felt like that was clear, so a little redundant there, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Genesis 15, 6 does not tell us how other men accounted Abraham. Instead, it tells us how God accounted him. Moses in Genesis does not indeed tell us that men 
thought of him, Abraham, but how he was accounted before the tribunal of God. Remember that righteousness is also more than the absence of evil and guilt. It is a positive good, meaning that God does not only declare us innocent, but righteous. Would you write? I was just saying, I feel like for two, two, five. Oh, <laughs> thought you like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not this one. Too, just... <clears throat> Four through five, a <sighs> distinction made between grace and works. The idea of grace stands opposite to the principle of works. Grace has to do with receiving the freely given gift of God. Works has to do with earning our merit before God. Charis, the ancient Greek word translated grace, signified in classical authors a favor done out of spontaneous generosity of the heart without any expectation of return. Of course, this favor was always done to one's friend, but never to an enemy. But when Charisse comes into the New Testament, it takes an infinite leap forward for the favor God did at Calvary was for those who hated him. I'm going to learn Greek, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Charisse. People speak Greek, yeah? In Greek? Okay. Me too. But I don't know if it's between ancient and a system of works seeks to put God in debt to us, making God owe us his favor because of our good behavior. In works thinking, God owes us salvation or blessings because of our good works. To begin with, God isn't praising laziness here. The atheist is not simply between the worker and the non-worker, but between the worker and the person who does not work but believes. It doesn't say atheist? No, it says antithesis. 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 Oh, so like somebody who's oppo the opposition. Antithesis. Antithesis. That's the antithesis is not simply between the worker and the non-worker, but between the worker and the person who does not work, but believes. Mm -hmm. That's what you had written down earlier. Yeah, that's right. What did you, how did you write it? If justified by works, God owes us. If justified by grace, we owe God. Righteousness can never be accounted to the one who approaches God on the principle of works. Instead, it is given to the one who believes on him who justifies the ungodly. This is who God justifies, the ungodly. We might expect God would only justify a godly man, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, God can justify the ungodly. It isn't as if God is happy with our ungodly condition. We are not justified because of our ungodliness, but despite our ungodliness. Morris quoting Denny. The paradoxical phrase, him that justifieth the ungodly, does not suggest that justification is a fiction, whether legal or of any other sort, but that is a miracle. Just as Abraham, so our faith is accounted for righteousness. This was not some special arrangement for Abraham alone. We can enter into the relationship with God also. By this, we understand that there are not two ways of salvation, saved by works through the law, keeping the Old Testament, and saved by grace through faith in the New Testament. Everyone who has ever been saved, Old or New Testament, is saved by grace through faith, through their relationship of a trusting, loving God. Because of the new covenant, we have benefits of salvation that the Old Testament saints did not have, but we do not have a different manner of salvation. Verses 6 through 8, David and the blessedness of justification through faith. King David of the Old Testament knew what it was like to be a guilty sinner. He knew the seriousness of sin and how God 
and how good it is to truly be forgiven. He knew the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. If David were judged on works alone, the righteous God must condemn him. Nevertheless, he knew by experience that blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Quote, no sinner, and try he ever so hard. What in the old language is this? Yep. No sinner, and try he ever so hard. Mm -hmm. Like, why do we need to talk like that? No. We don't. Yeah. I'm going to try again. Last time. No sinner, and try he ever so hard, can possibly carry his own sins away and come back cleansed of guilt. No amount of money, no science, no inventive skill, no armies of millions, nor any other earthly power can carry away from the sinner one little sin and its guilt. Once it's committed, every sin and its guilt cling to the sinner as close as does his own shadow, cling to an eternity unless God carries them away. Mm. Lenski. David agrees with Abraham regarding the idea of imputed righteousness, a goodness that is given and not earned. Our adversaries, the Papists, oppose the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. They cavil at the very word, and yet the apostle useth the word ten times in this chapter. In the Psalms quoted, Psalms 32, 1 through 2, David speaks of the blessedness, not of the one who is justified through works, but of the one who is cleansed through imputation. Imputation means it's a statistical term, process of replacing missing data with substituted values. This is centered on what God places upon us, the righteousness of Jesus, not on what we do for God. So this is actually the last section. So this says, Abraham was counted righteous before he was circumcised. Therefore, he was not counted righteous because he was circumcised. If we are counted righteous by God because of faith, not because of circumcision or any other ritual, then the blessedness mentioned in Romans 4, 7 can be given to the uncircumcised Gentiles by faith. Mm -hmm. Abraham was counted as righteous in Genesis 15, 6. He did not receive the covenant of circumcision until Genesis 17, which was at least 14 years later. Therefore, his righteousness wasn't based on circumcision, but on faith. I look, he feel like we should do enduring word first. Mm -hmm and read the devotional, like, last. Doing it the opposite way is making it a little hard to take notes because I don't want to write some stuff because I'm like, maybe it'll be an enduring word and I can put it in order, mm -hmm. but then some stuff isn't an enduring word. So I think it would be better to swap it. What do you think? Sure, we try. It isn't like a solid plan. We kind of make it up as we go. We make it up as mm -hmm. we go, that's right. Abraham, the father of all those who believe, was declared righteousness while he was still uncircumcised. <laughs> Therefore, how could anyone then say, as some did in Paul's day, that Gentiles must be circumcised before God to be declared righteous? For the Jewish people of Paul's day, the significance of circumcision was more than social. It was the entry point for a life lived under the law of Moses, and I testify Again, to every man who becomes circumcised, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Hmm. Galatians 5.3. What did they circumcision? Circumcision, word of the day. Hmm. The Jews of Paul's day thought circumcision meant they were true descendants of Abraham. Paul insists that to have Abraham as your father, you must walk in the steps of faith that Abraham Abraham, that Abraham walked in. Our father Abraham is an important phrase, one that the ancient Jews jealously guarded. They did not allow a circumcised Gentile convert to Judaism to refer to Abraham as our father in the synagogue. A Gentile convert had to call Abraham your father, and only natural born Jews could call Abraham our father. Paul throws out that distinction and says that through faith, 
all can say, our father Abraham. Mm -hmm. It must have been a shock for the Jewish readers of this letter to see that Paul called Abraham the father of uncircumcised people. Faith, not circumcision, is a vital link to Abraham. It is far more important to have Abraham's faith and the righteousness imputed to him because of it than to have Abraham's circumcision. Mm. William Barclay explains that Jewish teachers of Paul's day had a saying, what is written of Abraham is also written of his children, meaning that the promises given to Abraham extend to his descendants. Paul heartily agreed with this principle and extended the principle of being justified by faith to all Abraham's spiritual descendants, those who believe, who also walk in the steps of faith of Abraham. Hmm. Okay, so after we do the enduring word, we do the essentials, which is this one, Essentials Life Bible. Now they have an app. It looks like this. I don't actually know if it's up or not yet. It looks like this. And they have this QR scanner. So the next one that we're on is four. Oh, no. No, I don't think we do. The next one is 423. So you can kind of see here. I'll show you guys. You can see here there's a big chunk, and then the QR code corresponds to the last verse that's in there. So this one's actually 423. So we only went up to 412, so we don't have a sermon today by Jean, but this is probably my favorite part of the study. So definitely looking forward to that. Next is Quest. So, again, this is just a question study Bible. Why did Paul bring Abraham into the argument? 4, 1, 2, 3. Abraham is exhibit A, first person to be called God's friend. How he, how he became God's friend supports Paul's point. Abraham did not earn God's friendship through good deeds. Abraham simply took God at his word and believed the promise. It was his trust that pleased God, not his works. Paul hoped this strong evidence from Abraham would convince others that, he, that they could be made righteous simply by believing. What value did circumcision have? Circumcision was a sign of the covenant between God and his people, so it served as a reminder to the Israelites of God's promise and their vows. Over time, the Jews came to see circumcision itself as what made them acceptable to God, and so it became a symbol of dependence on human effort rather than God's grace. Paul was, rem was reminding them that the outward sign is not important as the inward reality. See what circumcision was wrong. Like a wedding ring? Mm-hmm. Like a wedding ring is like a symbol of marriage mm. and you could wear a wedding ring and still be like oh basically mm. you could say like well i have the ring i get by i'm a wife but you'd be using the ring as just a justification yeah. for everything that you do mm. it would be weird if you're like i'm a wife but like i'm still on bumble or i'm still on tinder but i have a wedding ring so i've fulfilled all of my wifely duties yeah it's like it's not how that works I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I hate to say rules, but I liked in that one book that we did where it said the rules in the original meaning of the Bible meant like a trellis or a framework for mm -hmm. things to grow. But so I just wrote like it's symbolic, but out of love, we live under certain rules. Yeah. yeah, that was like something I said. I don't know if I told you, Maddie had said in her podcast, she said, you know, when you're walking down the aisle to your future husband, the groomsman, similar to like the relationship with Christ, you're walking down the aisle full of love and overflowing with love and totally wanting to make this commitment. Yeah. But knowing like with this commitment comes rules. Yeah. But you're not walking down the aisle thinking like, oh, I no longer can go out as long as I want. Now I have to text somebody like, oh, now I can't be on Bumble or like whatever it is that single people do that married people can't do. Like all those things. Mm -hmm. You're not like walking down the aisle like, now I have to do this. Yeah, but like regrets. people walk down the aisle to Jesus like, oh, well, now I can't cuss and now I can't do this. Now I can't do that. I can't be lazy. You walk down the aisle to Jesus with like all this like bitterness instead of an overflow of, no, I yeah. love Jesus and I get to do these things. Well, yeah, and that's what I'm saying, like, that's very works-based, because, like, what does ultimately that feeling of negativity come from? Yeah. It's the fact that you feel like you owe God. Yeah. Good. And then that's the whole thing, where it's like, you're justified in your sin, not justified to sin. Like, if you're lazy, like, 
you're not called to be lazy. Someone can rebuke you for being lazy. And like that should be, you should listen to, you know, ultimately your consciousness and ultimately God about that. But it's not like, you know, God owes you salvation, God owes you salvation, God owes you anything. Like you just realize I'm like coming from a heart posture of like, no, like I'm a sinner, I'm a broken person, I'm, you know, wicked. And God forgives me for that. God loves me. Yeah. And he sees put on a like the the Bible and I would think readings, like we are not justified by what we do. By what we do, we're justified by grace. Yeah. You know, like that's by thing. grace through faith. Next is the student study Bible. So this study Bible I actually really love. And again, I talk about all of these in my other Bible study, but if you haven't watched that one, I'll just say this is a really good resource if you're a new Christian or even if you're an older Christian and you kind of just want to understand the Bible more. It breaks down almost every single verse and gives you an explanation or just a little further commentary on all the verses of the Bible. So we're going to go ahead and do verses 1 through 12 of chapter 4. Four two. If Abraham stood in the right before God on the basis of his good works, then he could truly boast, since his obedience would be function as the basis of the relationship with God. But Paul insists that Abraham could not boast before God. 4.3. The point of the previous verse is not that Abraham could boast before men. Instead, there was no basis for boasting at all. For Abraham stood right before God, believing not by doing. It's in Genesis 15.6 proofs. 4.4. 4. Paul uses his example from everyday life. If salvation were based on works, then God is in granting a person salvation would merely repay what he owed that person, just as the employer gives wages for his work. Or five. Under the gospel, however, work comes from a completely different equation. Righteousness does not come from those who work for God. Like since all, like Abraham, Joshua twenty four two, are by God's absolute standards ungodly. Rather, right standing righteousness comes as it did for Abraham by believing in place of working. Four six through eight. Paul introduces David as the second example of righteousness by faith, citing Psalms 32, 1-2 through 2, to demonstrate David's righteousness, whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered, was not based on his works. 9-10 through 10. Abraham was righteous before God in Genesis 15, 6, before he was circumcised in Genesis 17, and therefore circumcision is unnecessary in order to belong to God. 4-11 Circumcision was a sign and seal of Abraham's righteousness that belonged to him but by faith. In other words, circumcision was documented and rather than righteousness by faith, Abraham enjoyed before his circumcision. Now, usually we don't read my study Bible because my husband has one study Bible. I have another study Bible. They're pretty similar, but just so that you guys can kind of see like how similar, I'm actually going to read my study Bible today. So, Abraham 4.3. Abraham had a right standing before God by believing, not by doing. Genesis 15.6. 4, 6 through 8. Paul introduces David as a second example of righteousness by faith, citing Psalms 11. Sign, seal. Circumcision proved the righteousness by faith that Abraham had before his circumcision. And my devotional is definitely a lot shorter, um, but it's this one is nice to have, like, if you're not looking to go super, super, super deep and be overwhelmed, but it's kind of nice that we have both. both. Yeah. yeah. We love Bibles. We have hundreds of Bibles. Here's another Bible. So this one is the Jesus Bible, and it looks like 4-3. Yep. You want to read that one or you want to read it? No. The gospel is not only central message in the New Testament. It's also the storyline of the entire Bible. For Paul and Romans 4, Abraham is the case study of salvation by faith. By the time Paul wrote this letter, Jewish belief was that Abraham was justified because of his circumcision and his willingness to sacrifice Isaac. If that were the case, Abraham would have earned righteousness with his works. As he builds this, his argument for salvation by faith in Jesus alone, Paul is concerned that his audience understand that there is only one way a person is made righteous before God, through faith. In verses 9-16, through 16, Paul confronts the issue of Abraham's righteousness with the simple issue of chronology. chronology. God declares Abraham righteous prior to his obedience and hundreds of years before God gave the law to Moses. Therefore, Abraham's faith saved him, just as today... God's people are only saved through the same kind of faith. So lastly is just applications. Sometimes I get applications while we're going, but since the applications is empty, we'll just take a quick second to talk about like how we can actually apply what we just learned to our life. Do you yeah. have any um, thoughts? Yeah, just kind of like what we already said and recapping was just like realizing that like we are not justified by works. Like, you can't, like, you know, appease God by being a good person. 
Ooh, we can't sit there and be like, all right, cool. Like if I hold the door for the person, a Wawa, or I'm kind of my wife or kind of, you know, my husband or whatever does not make God happy. With me. I mean, as much as it does, but it's not going to justify me and get me into heaven. Mm-hmm. Whereas realizing, Hey, like I'm a broken person. And because I'm a broken person, like I owe God everything. And that includes like, I owe God, you know, being a good person. Mm-hmm. Okay, so in summation, do not boast in good deeds. Do good out of an overflowing love for Jesus. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Alrighty, guys, so it's about 6.45 now, so you might have noticed the light changed, the sun came up. Um, With that being said, this is the end of our devotional. This is typically what a morning looks like. Outside of that, we are also doing the New Testament, so... Today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 3, so we'll read, uh, no, we read 3 yesterday, so we'll read 4, 5, and 6 today. As you can see, we've been doing the New Testament with my 90-day challenge. If you guys are interested in joining that challenge, I will have the link for that down below. You can absolutely join anytime. We're just reading the New Testament from front to back over the next 90 days. Hello, friends. So my phone did die, but praise Jesus that I was actually able to get the entire Bible study recorded and it cut out just here at the end. But drop down below in the comments. Let me know what you want us to study. My husband and I absolutely love doing Bible study. Let me know if you guys have any questions, if you guys have any Bible study recommendations. If you like this video and you like this video style, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe to my page. And make sure your post notifications are on because like I said, I post three videos a week. One on Wednesday, one on Thursday, and one today on Faith Fridays. But until then, be blessed and I'll see you guys next time.